in between the eyes. Yes, it was all good. Yeah, looks good. Okay, great, thank you. No problem, and let me give you back your I was talking. Yeah, I was talking to my parents in Scotland, and they had the heating on in the house. So I was like, "Oh my god, I feel like I'm in the ice storm." Yeah.
Good morning, everyone. Um, just an announcement that in about three minutes we will begin. And I would really like it if you could possibly consider moving a little bit closer. Um, that would be very nice, especially for our speaker. So um, if you could just begin moving forward. Thank you. I wanted to mention to you that um, the university bookstore, which has some of the books that the speakers at this conference have written, they're available in the bookstore. And the bookstore is on the ground level of this building. So I highly recommend that you go down there and uh, take a look at what's available. Um, and I wanted to just tell you that yesterday, for those of you who weren't here, we had a very important day in terms of all of the different speakers who uh, made presentations, as you see in the program, on the different topics, really brought together this interdisciplinary understanding of issues regarding women in the world in relation to a paradigm for a, 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 you know, for a new paradigm for peace. And it's so important because I, we were speaking this morning on the way in with one of my friends that each one puts it in a different context. And eventually, those different spaces or those different perspectives really help us to understand uh, more thoroughly, more holistically, the issue. And I think that's been one of the most important uh, elements of this conference and the contributions of the presenters. I'm grateful to them. But we're not done yet. So uh, this morning, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Professor Daphna Joel, who is the professor of neuroscience and psychology at Tel Aviv University in Israel. Um, Daphne Joel uh, is um, at the, is it Sagol School of Neuroscience in Tel Aviv University. She studies questions related to the brain, sex, and gender, but she does much more than that. And in a minute, I'll show you the book she's written. In a series of papers, she has described and tested the mosaic hypothesis, which is the name of uh, gender mosaic, is the name of her new book, and the flyer is there, and a copy is on the table. So in a series of papers, she has described and tested the mosaic hypothesis, the claim that sex differences in the brain do not add up consistently in individuals. Rather, most brains are composed of both features more common in females, and some features more common in males. Other studies focus on the perception of gender identity and its relation to sexuality. Ongoing studies attempt to characterize the relations between sex and brain structure and function. So she has authored this 
forthcoming book, Gender Mosaic, Beyond the Myth of the Male and Female Brain. So it's really my pleasure to have this opportunity to introduce Dr. Joel to you. And the title of her talk is, Are There Male Brains and Female Brains, and Why Do We Care? Dr. Joel, welcome. Thank you very much, and th thank you for coming at this early time of the morning, especially those that come from the West. Uh, and thank you, Huda, for inviting me, and Kate for taking care of everything. So, well, you almost said everything, but I, uh, still, I will talk about these two questions, are the male and female brains, and then why do we care? And I guess you know that many people believe that men and women are fundamentally different, men from Mars, women from Venus. And that the reason that we are so different is that men have male brains and women have female brains. Now, whenever we hear or read about a difference between women and men in behavior, cognitive abilities, personality traits, the brain, our belief in the male and female brain becomes stronger. And the reason that it becomes stronger is that we use our knowledge of sex differences in the genitalia as a model to understand sex differences in other domains, including brain and behavior. Now, sex differences in the genitalia are very unique because they almost always add up consistently within each individual to create one of two distinct systems male genitalia or female genitalia. Now, the images that uh, you see here on the right, it's a great wall of female external genitalia. It's a part of an artwork by an artist, Jamie McCartney. And on the left, great wall of uh, male external genitalia, I've created, not the way you think I did, I used Google <laughs> images. <laughs> and you can imagine the types of ads I get since. <laughs> but I would do anything for science. <laughs> now, the reason I brought this here is not just to you know, wake you up at this time of the morning, but because they nicely illustrate my main point, and this is that sex differences in the genitalia do add up consistently within individuals, almost always. So humans either have a set of only female genital organs or a set of only male genital organs. And it is ro only rarely that a baby is born and it does not fit into one of these types. Either because this baby has a, a, a genital organ in a form intermediate between the male typical and the female typical form, or because this baby has both female typical organs and male typical organs. And these babies are usually classified as intersex, the term is again changing, but they are not classified as male or female. So when we see these images, and we all know these images, it is very easy to understand why humans, people, including scientists, believe that sex differences in other domains behave similarly. It's an implicit assumption. It's not something that has been tested. But we, are, we just use our knowledge of sex effects on the genitalia, and we use it to understand other domains. However, there is good reason to believe that this is not happening in the brain. And the reason to suspect that sex differences do not add up consistently in the brain is that we have evidence from animal studies that sex effects on the brain may be different and sometimes even opposite under different conditions. And because this is a huge difference between sex effects on brains and genitalia, I want to illustrate this looking at a single study. So this is a study in rats, and the researchers looked at the density of dendritic spines. So this is a neuron, the green, it's not really green, it's just uh, injected something to make it green. Uh, so this is a neuron, and the green uh, extensions are the dendrites, 
and the small red dots along the dendrites are the dendritic spines. And here we see a microscope uh, picture of a piece of dendrite from a male rat at the left and from a female rat, uh, rat on the right, and you can easily see the difference. So it's not a clitoris and a penis, penis but it's a difference. There was another group of rats in this study, and these rats underwent 30 minutes of stress. And the next day, their brains were assessed. And again, we see a sex, a sex difference, but it is exactly the opposite. So what we thought was typical of males, few spines, we now see in the female. What we thought was typical of females, lots of spines, we now see in the males. So of course, this never happens in the genitalia. No matter how stressed I may be right now, <laughs> when I go to the toilet, nothing is going to change in my genitalia. But some things will change in my brain. So the important point, and I have two very important slides. This is the first one. So the important uh, point to take from this slide is that sex affects the brain. You can see it. You can see the differences between males and females, both stressed and no stressed. Now, usually when we hear that sex affects the brain, we immediately continue to conclude that this must mean that there are male brains and female brains. And what I want to, I hope to do today is convince you that this is not a necessary conclusion. So sex affects the brain. What is it about sex that affects the brain? We don't know because they didn't test. It could be the difference in genetic uh, components, XY versus X, uh, XX. It can be the differences in the levels of hormones. It could be other factors. So something about sex is causing this difference. But how it will affect the brain depends on other factors. There are many studies like this, and they show this, this type of reversal or uh, reversal of sex effects in different regions of the brain, uh, for the different uh, features of the brain. I've just showed you dendritic uh, morphology. In a minute, I'll show you receptor density and other features. Uh, and also following different manipulations. Uh, we, saw, we just saw acute stress. I'll show you in a minute the effects of chronic stress. It can be stress experienced already in utero. So they will stress the mother, the dam in rats, and then look at the brain of the offspring offspring when they reach adulthood, and you can see this type of reversal. So if you heard, for example, that testosterone masculinizes the brains of males already in utero, it is in a sense true. We have lots of evidence that testosterone, as well as other hormones, affect the brain already in utero. But how it will affect the brain depends on other factors. So the brain of an adult male may be similar in some features to the brains of an adult uh, female because something happened during pregnancy. Now, when you look at all of these studies, as I have done, what you see is that these environmental events do not flip the entire brain from the female form to the male form or vice versa. They affect the form of only some features. So even if you assume that at some specific point, let's say now, my entire brain is in the female typical form, then following an event, a lecture or whatever, some features of my brain will change the form, other will not, and I will end up with a mosaic brain, a brain composed of both female typical and male typical features. And again, because this is so, such a crucial difference and it's so important, I want to demonstrate this again with a single study. This one is from uh, the lab of Peg McCarthy, which is a professor here in this university. Again, rats, this time they looked at the density of cannabinoid receptors. This is why we have this sleeve here. And what you see here is a density in males on the left and females on the right in two regions of the hippocampus. It's a brain region. We won't concern ourselves with it now. And you can easily see the difference. So the males have much higher density of receptors compared to the females in both regions of the hippocampus. Now they had another group of rats, and these rats underwent three weeks of stress. So now we're talking about chronic stress in adulthood. And you can see a difference. So 
in the uh, dorsal hippocampus, we see exactly the same, the reversal of sex effects. What we, was, we thought was typical of males, high density, we now see in the stressed females. What we thought was typical of females, low density, we now see in the uh, males. In the ventral hippocampus, something else is happening. The males again switch from, if you want, the male form to the female form, but the females do not change. So if we, by definition, define the male typical and female typical forms as the forms we see in the no stress condition, then males will have blue, male hippocampus, females will have pink, female hippocampus. Following stress, the male switch to a female hippocampus in both dorsal and ventral regions, but the females end up with a mosaic. Right, the dorsal hippocampus is in the male form, the, female hippo the ventral hippocampus is in, is in the um, female form. Now, this is a single study looking at a single brain feature, the density of CB1 receptors, in a single brain region following a single manipulation. Now, take this study and multiply it by the enormous complexity of the brain. So many neurons and neurotransmitters and receptors and the morpho complex morphology of neurons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, co multiply this again by the huge variability of the environment from the moment of conception till the moment that we all gather here. And you can understand why it's really unlikely that brains will be internally consistent, and it's much more likely that they would have a mosaic of features. So this is a mosaic hypothesis, which I formulated in 2011, and it took me a few years to understand how to study this in the human brain. And to do this, I created a collaboration with Yaniv Asaf, who is a professor of neuroscience from Tel Aviv University, an expert in MRI of the human brain, and a group of students. And together, we looked at over 1,400 brains of humans. And we used these images. I'm sure you are familiar with these MRI. And we did many things. I'm only going to show you one analysis. In this analysis, we divided each brain into 116 regions of gray matter. Now, you probably know that brains can be divided into gray matter, where the neurons reside, and white matter, when the connections between the neurons reside. In this analysis, we only looked at gray matter. In others, we looked at the entire brain. Once we had this division, we could measure the volume of each of these 116 regions and create an Excel file, and I'm explaining because I'm going to use it. In this Excel file, each line represents a single brain of a single individual, 116 volumes of each of the regions. And once we had this file, we used a color scale between large, green, and small, yellow, and colored each cell in each brain. So for example, if you look at this region in this brain, it is relatively large compared to the, uh, this region in other brains, then we will color it green. And if we look at this region, it is actually relatively small compared to other brains, then it will be yellow. Okay, so we do this cell by cell, and when we are done, this is what we get. On the left, you see brains of men. On the right, you see brains of women. I remind you, each line is a single brain, and you can easily see the differences. You don't need complex statistical methods. Women have more green, men have more yellow. So there are differences between the brains of men and women. But you can also eas as easily see that these differences do not add up consistently within individuals to create green and yellow brains. Rather, most people have a mosaic, each a unique mosaic of green, which is more common in women, and yellow, which is more common in men. So this is a second important image. So I want to stress that the question for me is not whether there are differences between the brains of men and women at the group level. You can easily see that there are such differences. I am also not concerned with the question of the source of these differences, nature or nurture. And I'll talk about it later. But at this point, I am not concerned with the source of the differences. 
The only question that I would like to answer is, do these differences add up consistently within individuals to create male and female brains as sex differences in the genitalia almost always do? Or do they mix up, as I've just showed you, happens in the rat hippocampus? And I think when you look at the images, the answer is very uh, clear. Brains, human brains, do not come in two distinct forms, male and females. A female as human genitalia do, but rather we each have a unique mosaic of features. So if there are no male brains and female brains, are there men and women? I'm not sure you were ready to this question so early in the morning. <laughs> So obviously, there are differences between women and men in cognition, in personality characteristics, in preferences, attitudes, behaviors. There are fewer differences than we tend to believe. And again, I'm not concerned at all with the question of the source of the differences, nature or nurture, but only in whether these differences add up consistently within each of us to create two types of humans. And to answer this question, well, I'm sure you know the answer because you can use insight and you know about yourself that you have both feminine and masculine characteristics, but I'll still do the science, okay? Um, so we used a very similar approach to what I've just showed you. We looked at the behavior, cognitive abilities, etc., of over 5,000 humans. And we used data sets that are available to anyone. And in each such data set, we chose the variables that show the largest differences between men and women. And for each of these variables, again, we have this Excel file and we color the, the scores. But this time we use this pink feminine to blue masculine uh, scoring system or coloring system. So we can do two together. So for example, if someone has very high self-esteem, you don't have to read the study to know that this person should be colored in blue, right? Self-esteem is higher in men compared to women in average. And if someone has, is really worried about her or his weight, then we will color this in pink. You don't know any gender stereotypes? <laughs> okay. We can do another one just to test you. Problem behavior, if someone really has a lot of uh, behavioral problems, then it will be blue, right? Okay, so, and actually the stereotypes, you can, what we find is very similar to the stereotypes. So the average differences fit the stereotype. So again, we have people and we color each cell, and when we do this, this is what we have. So you have men on the left, Women on the right, there were simply more women. This is why they have two tables. I remind you, each line is seven variables in a, of a single person, and you easily see the group level differences. So there is more blue at the men's side, more pink on the women's side. This is how we defined what's blue and what's pink. If it wasn't this way, there was something wrong with the code, okay? You can also see that there is quite a lot of pink in the blue, quite a lot of blue in the pink. This is because for any psychological variable that we can measure, there is some overlap between men and women. So you see the overlap. But again, this is known. We were not interested in this. Our question was, are there blue and pink people? And in this sample, as well as some others, there was not even a single human being that has seven, only seven characteristics that were only masculine, blue, or only feminine, pink. However, there were about 60% of the group that had both highly masculine and highly feminine features. So obviously, humans do not come in two types, men and women, girls and boys, female nature and male nature. Yet I, our entire society treats humans as if they do. When a nursery teacher says, all the boys take the ball, go play outside, all the girls come listen to a story, he or she implicitly assumes that kids come in two types. One type of kids who love playing ball but don't like to listen to stories, and other types who love 
play, uh, listening to stories doesn't like to play ball. But obviously, with even only these two characteristics, we can think of four types of kids, those two, and then another type of kids who love playing ball and love listening to stories, and the fourth of kids who like neither. Now, this is only two characteristics. If we look at more gender characteristics, then the number of potential mosaics is enormous. Yet we have this social system we call gender, which takes this enormous human variability and forces it into two boxes, girls and boys, men and women, male nature, female nature. So I think it's time to get rid of the gender binary. And I will come back to this later. But what I want to do now, after I hope I convince you that there are no male brains and female brains, is to go to the second question of why do we care? Why we as a society are really obsessed with sex differences, obsessed with the question of nature versus nurture, um, and, um, and uh, the explanation again lies in the gender binary. So the gender binary is not a new invention. Throughout history, we know that there were social system, systems that attributed a meaning, different roles, different behaviors, different characteristics to humans with female and male genitalia. What is new, or relatively new, is the use of science to justify the gender binary. Before science, we had religion to justify it, but since the emergence of science, science in the 17th century, science has been used repeatedly and is still used today to justify the gender binary and especially the inferior status of women in this social system. And at the beginning, it seemed like a very easy task because in the 17th century, scientists discovered that the skulls of men were on average larger than the skulls of women. Now, they already knew that the brain was important and they realized that there was some connection between the size of the skull and the size of the brain. So this was like a perfect explanation to women's intellectual inferiority uh, relative to men. And of course, to, this explains or can explain their inferior status in society. There was only one problem with this great explanation. And this is that there, is some, there are some animals who have much larger skulls than humans do. Whales, for example. Now, scientists that wanted to explain men's superiority over women clearly didn't want to explain whales' superiority over men. But they found a solution, and they looked at the ratio of the skull size relative to the body size. And when you do this, indeed, humans have the larger, largest ratio of skull to body. But yet, there was a new problem, because women have a larger skull ratio to body ratio compared to men. <laughs> now, if you think for even one minute that this led scientists to conclude that women were superior over men intellectually, and that therefore the entire social structure must be changed immediately to reflect this, well, you don't. OK, good. No, instead what they did is they found another piece of evidence and this is that the skull of children is relatively large compared to their body size to come up with a new theory. Now, I want you to, to pay attention that the facts are actually true. Every fact here is true. The problem is not the scientific evidence. The problem is the interpretation. So the new story, and we'll leave this example, 17th century after all. So the, the new story was that the normal development of humans is from a relatively large skull in in uh, children to a relatively small skull. And women, alas, are stuck in the middle. So they never get to the full mature uh, structure. 19th century, we have the same type of uh, discussions when the scientists started to study the actual brain and discovered correctly, again, that the brains of men are on average larger than the brains of women. And actually, this is the largest known difference between the brains of men and women that we currently know of. Uh, and uh, they also claim, based on this uh, finding, that women can go to universities. <laughs> They were prohibited at that time from going, but now we had scientific reason to prohibit them from going. 
Now, of course, you laugh because it seems ridiculous when, for many years now, women outnumber men in any level of academic studies. So this seems ridiculous that scientists scientists could have believed that women cannot go to universities because their brains are smaller. Now, don't get me wrong. As I said, women's brains are smaller on average than men's brains. It is, not, it is not the brain that changed. It is social norms and laws that prohibited women from studying that changed. Now, the reason that these old versions of the myth of the male and female brain uh, we so re easily recognized as a myth is because they are old fashioned. The science is old fashioned. You know, neuroscience has advanced, advanced much than speaking about the size of the brain as relevant to something. And of course, the social structure that they try to explain no longer exists. But the idea of using the myths of the male and female brain to explain current social order did not change. This is still with us, and every too often, a new, uh, um, a new paper comes out which reports some differences between the brains of men and women and uses them to explain the current social order where women do some things, men do other things, the differences in status, in power, etc. And the general uh, or the assumption that this myth uh, hold is that there are differences between males and females, and this, this is why as a culture we are obsessed with these differences, and every scientific finding of a difference gets the headlines everywhere around the world. The second assumption is that these differences are natural, and therefore we are obsessed with the question of nature versus nurture, some trying to convince us it is nature, others trying to convince us it is nurture, and the third assumption is that if it's natural, then we should celebrate the differences. And I actually want to start with the last assumption, that if we find out that the differences that we see between women and men are natural, pre-programmed, et cetera, then we should celebrate them. And I want to challenge this assumption. I want to claim that we never celebrate nature except when it comes to differences between social groups. It can be on the basis of a sex category, it can be on the basis of color, it can be of other different uh, social categorizations, but otherwise we never celebrate nature. Actually, most of our culture is built against nature. And I want to give two examples. The first is, suppose tomorrow we find a mutation and children with this genetic mutation would not be able to acquire reading. What should we do with these children? Should we give up on teaching them how to read? Probably we would do just the opposite. We will find these children and from a very young age do whatever we can, put all the efforts, time, money, etc., to help these kids acquire reading. Because reading is a necessary skill in human culture. Similarly, aggression. Aggression is surely a natural trait in humans. If you look around any other animal, they can be aggressive sometimes, and so can we. So aggression is a natural tendency in humans. Do we celebrate it? To the contrary, we have entire social systems to fight our natural tendency to be aggressive. We teach our kids to use their mouth and not their hands. We have police for those who didn't get this so well. We have prisons, we have courts. We have whole systems to fight this natural tendency. Then why treat sex differences differently? Let's say this story about the male and female brain were true. Let's say testosterone increased the risk of men to be violent. So this should this allow men to carry a weapon? Is this, this, should this be a license for men to kill? Obviously, just the contrary. If someone has a tendency to be violent, regardless of the reason, genes, hormones, mild parental treatment, socioeconomic status, we need to do whatever we can to help this person control his natural or not natural, but even if it's natural, it's natural tendency to be violent. We never celebrate natural causes. 
We don't celebrate the genetic mutations that will disrupt kids from not being able to read and say, let's celebrate this. They cannot read. Wow, this is great. No, we do just the opposite. So why treat sex differently? So I want to end, and I'll come back to this question. I want to end with a vision, which I promised before. A vision of a world with no gender. A world in which there would be, naturally, humans with female, male, or intersex genitalia, but in which the form of the genitalia will carry no social meaning. Now, I know it's really difficult to imagine such a world. So I want to help you, uh, because I've did it many times now, uh, and look at handedness as a physical trait that used to carry lots of meaning. People with left, that were left-handed were considered not as intelligent, not as capable as humans with, that were right-handed. And uh, probably some of you know that there were times not so far ago that children that were using their left hand, they used to tie their left hand so to make them use the right hand. And even the terms left hand and right hand, which makes the left hand the wrong hand, right? So we have it still in our language. But it disappeared completely. Not handedness. Handedness is still with us. But there is no social meaning attached. And it's really for historians, sociologists, I think it's a really interesting question how this disappeared. Because there used to be uh, brain studies to try to explain the deficits in the in people that were left-handed to explain why they were left-handed. This has all gone. So this is the future I wish for us. A future in which we still ha can be different in our genital uh, organs, but in which this difference carries no social meaning. Now, I want to stress, and this goes back to the nature versus nurture question, that I have no idea whether in this gender-free world there would be differences between humans with male genitalia and female genitalia. There may be and there may not be. I don't know. But what I can assure you is that we wouldn't care. And why should we? If I like to do something, if my child likes to do something, do I ever care whether this something is more common in people with blue eyes or brown eyes? I never care about this. And even if I, I would, I wouldn't know because no one collects these statistics. So why should I care whether something I like or my child likes is more common in people with male or female genitalia? So I want to leave you with this uh, thought and just go back to all the important images we have here, we can easily divide almost all humans into two categories when it comes to the form of the genitalia. However, we cannot do this when we look at brains or at human behavior, psychological characteristics, etc. And this mixing up of sex effects is not about gender. It's something of sex itself. We see it also in animals. This is a characteristic of how sex affects the brain, that the effects mix up and they do not add up consistently to create two systems. Uh, so this is the idea of the mosaic, and thank you for listening. Uh, and I think we're open for questions. Good morning and thank you. Um, so when you look at, well, a lot of times we process things in absolute. Yes, you know, it is just slower. I said we process things sometimes in absolute, male and female, which are gender types. However, there's a huge impact of obviously um, hormones, the, you know, estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone. That gives us variance within the female gender, within the male gender. And how much of that, because obviously that happens in utero, major, about three or four times in utero. And then the activities that we expose our children to, nature versus nurture, all of that has an impact on how you would see the nuances of a male and female being very similar. Maybe they have the same levels of those, those hormones, whether they are male and female. So the absolutism doesn't kind of work for male and female, but what are our chemical levels, which we never test for, I mean, I don't know what my level for these three hormones are. They, they may be very similar to a male. 
So that would give us the commonalities that might, you know, explain some of the results that we have there. So is there science that's going on to do the overlap? Now that you have all this great data, what were the hormone levels of all of those recipients? So, so thank you for the question, and I think it um, emphasizes that it's, and this is why I think the figure on the right, upper right side is really important, because this is animals that are under very controlled conditions. The variation within each sex is relatively small because of their highly controlled environment, and you still see the reversal of effect. So the fact that, the, for example, the female on the right has the male typical form of this dendrite is not because something is wrong or atypical about her sex, about the level of her hormones. It's because the interaction of her completely typical levels of hormones interacts with the environment to create a different type of person, and I think, or a different type of phenotype. And I think this is an important point. If someone has more masculine characteristics, this doesn't necessarily mean that his sex is more masculinized. No, it doesn't mean this. With the same levels of hormones, sex effects on the brain may be exactly opposite, not because of sex, but because of the environment. And this is the crucial point to understand. So yes, it's true that we all vary enormously also in the levels of hormones, etc. Sex as a system, as a biological system, is also not organized in two distinct sets, and I don't want to go into this. The genitalia is, is the exception. But the mosaic that you get is not because test, uh, sex is variable. It's because it interacts with other factors. Well, it well, depends what, uh, what is your, so she asked if you have to research forever these other factors. Well, the question is what is your question, right? So what do you want to study? And is sex the most important variable? A recent study uh, from Liz Elliott's uh, lab suggests that, or review of the data that she did, suggests that sex category explains only 2% of the variability in the human brain. So do we want to focus on these 2% or maybe we should look for the variables that explain a larger part of the percent? Maybe it's socioeconomic status, maybe it's age, maybe it's other factors, but we are so obsessed with the gender binary that in a sense it also interrupts with our ability to understand the brain, to understand health and disease, etc. Yes? I have two questions. One is... But let's do them one by one. I have very yeah. bad memory. Oh, okay. okay. I'll start out with the scientific one, which is looking at uh, some of the scientific data on, on sex differences in the 1800s and even early into the 1900s. There was this scientific uh, measuring of the size of the head and, and um, craniology, and there, was, and there was the assumption that uh, women, because their heads were smaller, would not uh, be able to uh, sustain the pressures of going to university, uh, whereas men who had larger brains could. So there was a scientific explanation that was accepted by scientists of the time uh, that was really based on evidence that now would be seen as pretty ridiculous. And so whenever we're looking at scientific evidence, don't we have to worry about that this is what we know now, but the future might bring up some, some issues that we can't even think about. So as I said before, often the problem is not the scientific evidence. It's true, men's w skulls are still larger than women's skulls. The problem is not the evidence, the problem is the interpretation. So we should always worry about the interpretation Let's talk about the scientific evidence. Where the interpretation biases scientific, it's not so much the evidence, but the questions. So it's again, why should we care so much about sex differences? This is a social issue. It's obviously not so much a medical or scientific issue. So the biases of the, our social understanding of the world affect science, but not necessarily so much the evidence, but more the questions and the interpretation of the evidence. I, I think this the medical also affects the way people see uh, gender roles and their potential. No, my, it's my the social that affects LGBT how we interpret life. the science, and we use the science to justify the social. But it always starts, it never starts from the science, it starts from the social. Um, the other is the issue of LGBTQ 
clarify because you were talking male and female, mm -hmm. but that most of them are also male or female. Yes, but are they affected by their by their identity, their sexual sex identity? So in the study, as I said, we use large data sets. Usually they only have what people mark and they are led to ch given the choice between male and female in most studies. So we don't know more about we this. But as I said, we, or as Huda said, I also studied gender identity and there, is, there are very weak relations between gender identity and sexuality. Um, and also we recently analyzed data Oh, no, it's, it's too specific, never mind. So anyway, we have no reason to believe that sexuality should, or people with specific sexualities should have uh, specific brain types. They will also have gender mosa a mosaic of brain features and of gender characteristics. I want to thank you for your talk. I thought it was really interesting. Thank you. Um, but I, I just have, I also have two questions, but I'm going to try to make it really short. Question A, um, do our genitalia change after childbirth? Mine did. Um, I mean, not, I mean, but I, it didn't I, I know you all didn't want to know that, but um, you know, it's like sometimes they reconform themselves and else, and you know what I mean? Anyway, it's not the point. The point is, and I was trying to like this, make this relationship between the genitalia and, you know, brain. And I'm thinking, because after childbirth, not only does genitalia possibly change in a few of us, but it could be that, do our brains change? I don't know, I'm not asking, it's a question. I mean, it's like, I, you made me think about this question, which I had never thought about before. Did my brain change after, after I had kids? So your brain changes all the time. It also changed now after my talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good to know. And, and, if, and if you remember- A positive way, right? Okay. I don't know. <laughs> Some people may say it, may think not. But, but if, if you remember things from this talk in a week or in a month mm -hmm. from now, it means that not only it, it, it changed, but it changed in a long lasting way. So obviously every event changes our brains. This is, what, this is the whole point about brains. They okay, are being good. plastic and they change. And of course, something as dramatic as giving birth and other dramatic experiences, of course it changes your brain. But how it changes your brain depends on other factors. Mm -hmm. So for example, some women will, may have postpartum depression, right. other women have euphoria. So they're both, they all undergo similar hormonal changes, but how, but these hormonal changes interact with the environment in this, probably in this case, and with genetics, assistability factors, with other factors to determine the outcome. Okay. Okay? Nice. And about your genitalia, they, they are changing all the time, also with age. You don't have to give birth for them to change, but they never switch from the female form to the male form. True. Okay, okay. so that they never switch categories. Okay. Um, the second question has to do with um, a few years ago, um, well, maybe time passes quickly, um, Harvard's university's president made this infamous statement about how women, uh, women's brains could, I guess, not process math. They, were, they could not be, do math as well as men because of their brains, right? So how would you respond to him, given your data? <laughs> he was fired already, but anyway, so. I know he was fired, but I'm just like saying, you know, pretend, pretend he was here, so, like, you know. And, so in the book, I actually devote a whole chapter, not okay. for him, but to the Google memo, probably um, you heard about the Google memo, and how you can okay. fight a myth of such, this kind of myth. But, I would say something else, and I'm going back to the idea of nature versus nurture is mm -hmm. not important. Let's say that by nature, women were the most successful uh, sex in mathematics. Let's say that in a world without gender, there would be more women in the Olympiads of mathematics than men. What should we do with this information? If now I have a boy and he really likes mathematics, should I tell him, forget about it, this is for women? Obviously not, but we do this all the time with girls. So if you strongly believe that nature is responsible for all the gender differences that we see, then it's really easy for you to give up this gendered world and go with a gender-free um, vision. Mm. Why? Because if it's nature that is doing all this, it will continue to do all this. We don't have to have this complex social systems to make sure that nature does what it's supposed to do. You never train your dog to be a dog, 
He's a dog, he will become a dog. So why should we train males and females to become true women and men? If you trust nature so much, so just let it do what it needs to do. So there is, however you look at it, there is no justification to our gendered society. I agree, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just reflecting that we started the talk with Dr. Golands, um, and then you know with what you're saying, and I'm putting the two together. Um, I learned that you know everything from Dr. Golands talk. We enter a world that's built in patriarchy, and that the structures need to be completely re redone. Um, I love this vision of gender. You know, where gender is not important important, um, but then I'm also thinking in practical terms because the world has not been restructured yet, that um, our, I'm really, th the question really relates to is there science or how would you illuminate um, advice on how to raise children to adopt that when every, all the messages that they get still support this, you know, binary. Um, if we had a playground where all the left-handed people didn't get to play and all the right-handed people played, you know, you, you see that every day when it comes to men and women, boys and girls. Um, and then, of course, we all know that the world is set up to, it's built by men to benefit men. So how, how would you advise um, us in raising our children, or you know, what can we do? That's a nature question, but I think in the meantime, until we have that restructured world, how do we get there? Yeah, so I don't want to advertise my book, but I have two chapters on this, so I, because yeah, it's a great question, and I have three boys, so I had to deal with this uh, question. So only like in one sentence, I think we should try to show them the gendered structuring of the world. We should not let them feel that there is no gender because it will, it's not true and when they go out to the world and they do it very early, they will discover that we weren't telling the truth. So I think the point is to tell them that this is gender and show them how ridiculous it is. And this is what I try to do, to show them in, in a, we go to a store, toy store, and one side is painted pink and the other blue, and show them how this restricts their ability to choose, and how ridiculous it is it's, that someone will think that boys would not like to play with, I don't know, uh, or read books or whatever. So to do this, and I, I must say that uh, I understood what I was doing only when one of my kids, he was about five years old, and he came back from a birthday party and he was always pink ribbons all around and he said he was a pink ninja. And he was going around the house throwing uh, pink ribbons on you know, enemies, only he saw them, but probably they were there. And he was very happy with himself. And then he came to me and he said, you know, mom, some people are very strange. They think boys don't like pink. So I spared him the history that, you know, 100 years ago it was blue and I said, Yes, I know, and why are they strange? They said, they are strange because I am a boy and I like pink. And at that moment I realized that I was doing something right. Because if he understands that if he is a boy and he likes pink, then obviously boys like pink, then, and the other people that don't think this way, they are the strange one, then he is okay. So that's the only thing that we can give our children to know who they are, to know that society tries to impose on them these boxes, and also to know to choose their fights. Because another, of one, another son chose once a, a, a pink a shirt for school, uh, he bought it, and then in the morning he said, you know, mom, I really love this shirt, but I don't feel like explaining now to all the kids that it's okay for boys <laughs> to like pink. So, and I said, no problem, we'll just return it. So it's okay, you can choose your fights. You don't need to fight all the time. Surely not as an old, uh, a grown up and also not as a child. So I think that's the point, that he could say, I like pink, but I just don't want to change the world now. It's okay. Okay. One more, this is the last one. Last one. Um, uh, 
there are so many thoughts in my head. <laughs> um, but I, I actually had a question that sounded quite similar to one that was just asked, but is not so much about parenting, but social policy. And I feel that many of the endeavors to allow for the advancement of all people, and then thinking particularly of how women have been subjugated, focus on speaking to the specific and unique needs of women as a category. So then, in what ways does one recognize that the experience right now uh, is in some ways very unique? So how do you balance that? And then also... Wait, wait, one. Okay, sorry. Uh, it's okay that you have that, I will not remember. So. Okay, sure, it's related, so... Ah, okay, so if it's related. Which was just also, will there always be a unique experience because of uh, many women uh, being involved, like uh, giving birth? Like, is there something about that, that particular experience that in some ways we can't write out? Yeah, so let's start with the first one. So, clearly the physiology has meaning at some situations. So if we go back to handedness, which is easy, in each room, at least in, in Israel, you have to have certain number of chairs that are for people to write, left-handed people, okay? You know what I'm talking about, right? And if you want to buy scissors, then you need, if you are left-handed, you need other types of scissors than right-handed people. So clearly, if someone has different types of genitalia, they need specific treatment for this. And if only people with Female genitalia can give birth, and obviously, if they give birth, because not all pe people with female genitalia do, then they should be treated for this, or given whatever is needed for this. So that's not a problem. We are different in different ways. In Israel, for example, Jews coming from different origins have different genetic background, and they have, therefore, different genetic diseases. So depending on your background, you get different tests for free from the government. Perfectly okay. But it's not perfectly okay if you use this background of mine to decide whether to hire me to, for the job or not. So treating the variability that we have and adjusting what society gives us according to it, perfectly okay. That's not a problem. The problem starts when we attribute meaning that goes well beyond the specifics that we need. Okay? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so some nice food for thought. And uh, we'll take a 10 minute break and be back here exactly at 15 after to begin our panel. Thank you.
because some of the others have slides and I can't remember. So all you'll have to do is take this and plug it in on the side. So oh, just to actually use, yeah. I see. You're gonna use, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to use, I want to put my oh, okay. I see. I see what on there doing. because I want to read my yeah, paper. Yeah, that's fine. Let me just grab my USB stick. Okay. Saved my last version. Okay. Hmm. Here it is. Right? Uh, no, is that that's it? Not it? It's not player. Okay. All right. Let me try this. Cancel that. I'm going to close out of here. I have another one if that doesn't. Can I email it to you? Yes. Why don't I do that? Because I'm connected yeah, right now. Where's my phone? It does say I'm connected, although I kind of doubt that's true. We're going to try it. Um, let's see. It seems to still be reading my. Anyway, it's about 15 years. I just have to grab my phone to do the second. I'm gonna eject your thing. It doesn't seem to be reading it. Anyhow. That's fine. Okay. If that didn't work, I can maybe try this side. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're fine. Got it? Yeah. Excellent. So what I'll do is then... So they'll just be right on the desktop? Perfect. Semester. I'm busy. <laughs> I feel as though I should get water, but I've already sat here, so I don't want to get off the stage. Uh, so 
people are running behind. And right here. Yeah, somewhere along there. It's going. It's under control. I get done. Like everything is hectic. Maybe I'll try this one. Everything is hectic. I know it can fit in here. I just have my keys. Yeah. So it's kind of like there we go. Well, I mean, I was saying this. I think I said this to you over the summer that, like, I think it's difficult to expect to get more work done. And, uh, I think I'll just want to actually. Okay. Right. There we go. I think it's kind of a matter of. I'm going to have a little ticker up there myself, but I just want it to ensure. So I feel like we're going to hear my presentation. Version of presentations they've heard from me in the past, so I can put it dated and shift it around. All right. It's all right. No, that's they wanted me to talk about this, so they put the timer on so that I can have it. The, not the timer, the what is it called? Okay, perfect. Timer. I'm just going to um, save that to the desktop so that. Okay, stopwatch, that's what I want. Okay, we have our panelists. Uh, one is going to be here momentarily. Uh, so this is the panel on sex, brain, gender, socialization. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator of the panel, Monica Cadillo, Assistant Professor of Sociology at the University of Maryland. She holds a PhD in sociology from New York University and has conducted domestic and international research in family demography, contraception, on sexual behavior, and other topics. One of her lines of research focuses on the demographic consequences of disruptions to women's social context. Her research aims to understand how exposure to increasing community violence in Mexico or to the opioid epidemic in the United States impact women's sexual activity, fertility, marriage, and cohabitation patterns. Another line of research focuses on the determinants of contraceptive use during adolescence and on how couple disagreement about fertility goals affects contraceptive use and unintended pregnancy in the United States. Please welcome the moderator of the panel, Dr. Monica Cadillo. Thank you very much for that introduction. So I will introduce the members of our panel today. Uh, we are very fortunate to have here today Cecily Hardaway, Assistant Professor of African American Studies uh, here at the University of Maryland in College Park. Uh, Dr. Cecily Hardaway uh, holds a doctorate in development psychology with a formal concentration in quantitative psychology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her program of research method melts uh, family studies with developmental and community psychology and applies a sociological lens toward understanding how race and socioeconomic status intersect and shape child development and family processes. Through her research, she seeks to uncover pathways to positive adaptation and upward socioeconomic mobility for African American children and families from diverse socioeconomic backgrounds. I'm also pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Don Do, Dao, 
uh, assistant professor of sociology at the University of Maryland here in College Park as well. Uh, she is a faculty associate at the Maryland Population Research Center here at the university and received a PhD in sociology from the University of California, Berkeley. She also earned a JD from Columbia University School of Law. Dr. Dow is an incoming director of the Critical Race Initiative. Her research examines the intersections of race, class, and gender within the context of the family, educational settings, the workplace, the law, and political mobilization. Her book, Mothering Well Black, The Boundaries and Burdens of Middle Class Parenthood with the University of California Press, examines African-American middle and upper middle class mothers' approaches to parenting their children and their views and decision making about work, family, and childcare. Finally, I'm also very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Rebecca Jordan Jung, uh, an associate professor of women's gender and sexuality studies at Barnard College. She is a sociomedical scientist specializing in study design and synthesis. She uh, is uh, affiliated uh, with uh, Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Barnard College in Columbia University and explores reciprocal relations between science and social hierarchies, including gender, sexuality, class, and race. Her first book, Storm, Brainstorm, The Flaws in the Science of Sex Differences, published by Harvard University Press in 2010, won a Distinguished Book Award from the Association for Women in Psychology. And her latest book, Testosterone, an Unauthorized Biography, was co-written with uh, Katrina Karkasis and will be published by Harvard University Press in October 2019. Thank you very much, and join me in welcoming this wonderful panel. Well, I want to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me to present today. Um, my name is Cecily Hardaway, and, I'm, and I am an assistant professor in African American Studies. Um, and today, I'm going to be talking to you about low-income African American women and the challenges of balancing work and family. Um, and um, you'll see that there's another author on this presentation. Her name is Megan. Pita, she's actually an undergraduate here at the University of Maryland who's excellent and who has actually been a big help with this project. So I want to acknowledge her um, in this presentation. So I'll start off by just giving some background about African American women and work. Um, so African American women with minor children are more likely to be employed than women in other racial and, et other racial and ethnic groups. Um, in 2016, about 65% of African American women with children under age six were employed. Um, and that's compared to about 61.5% of women in all other groups. Um, African American women have the shortest postpartum breaks in employment. Um, so after they give birth to children, um, they have sort of the shortest turnaround uh, between the time that they give birth and go back to work. Um, African American women are also more likely to engage in sustained full-time employment during the 18 years following their first child's birth. 
Also, um, when you think about African American women in work, you have to think about working conditions. Um, so African American women are working in less favorable um, conditions um, than other women. Um, so for example, things like non-standard work schedules, jobs that lack benefits, um, and other experiences like discrimination and bias in the workplace. Um, and poor working conditions really um, increase the difficulties around uh, meeting children's health needs and children's developmental needs um, while maintaining employment. Also, just a few other background facts. Um, African American women earn less than women in most other groups. Um, so you'll see an overrepresentation in terms of server, service sector occupations. Um, uh, some of this is due to lower levels of education um, and things like labor market discrimination. And overall, uh, African American women are more likely than women in other groups to be among the working poor. So among those who work at least 27 weeks in a year, uh, but their income still falls below the poverty line. Um, also, I guess a big thing to think about, um, especially in the context of the study that I'm gonna to talk to you about today is low wage employment. Um, a lot of particularly low income African American women are working in low wage um, employment. Um, and some of the characteristics of low wage employment include uh, poverty level wages, things like limited workers rights and little to no opportunity for advancement. Um, and welfare reform um, was particularly impactful for um, those who are working poor and those who would be among the working poor. Um, I'm referring to welfare reform because the study that um, I'll be talking about today was conducted right around the time of welfare reform. Um, and it had large impacts on um, as I said, those who are working poor and those who would be among the working poor. So welfare reform was enacted in the 1990s and it converted AFDC to um, TANF, so aid to families with dependent children into temporary um, assistance for needy families. And TANF really centered around time limits for welfare receipt, as well as strict work requirements. Um, and because of welfare reform, a lot of women were, uh, a lot of women on welfare were pushed off of the rolls and into low wage employment. Um, and as I mentioned, welfare reform um, has strict work requirements, uh, time limits, but another element was sanctions. So these financial penalty, penalties that people would incur for not complying with work requirements. So basically they um, take your cash assistance away if you don't um, comply with certain requirements. Also other aspects of uh, welfare reform, they separated food assistance or um, food stamps from cash assistance. So someone could receive food stamps without uh, being on uh, welfare or without receiving cash assistance, whereas before they were kind of tied together. Um, there's also requirements for job trainings. Um, they built in um, into the policy where if you have an additional child while you're on welfare, you can't uh, receive additional um, cash benefits. Um, and this is in particular to welfare reform, but one of the issues with welfare 
more broadly is that there's no real launching pad off of welfare. And some of what I'll talk about will uh, get into that. So my broad research question was, how do low-income African-American women navigate work and family? Um, so this is my general kind of broad question. Um, and you'll see that it kind of expanded to uh, include um, women navigating education as well as navigating the welfare system. Um, so the data I'm using for this project is from Welfare, Children and Families, a three-city study. Uh, this was an ethnographic study conducted from 1999 to 2003. Uh, there were 256 African-American, Mexican-American, Puerto Rican, and non-Hispanic white families. Um, at recruitment, each of those families had a target child between the ages of two and four. Uh, they were recruited from Chicago, Boston, and San Antonio. Um, some of the families were on TANF, some were non-TANF. Um, and the ethnographers met with each family once or twice per month for 12 to 18 months, and follow-up interviews were conducted every six months thereafter through 2003. Um, and for my particular um, research that I'll talk about today, I'm specifically focusing on 26 African-American women living in Chicago. My intention is to focus on the full sample of African-American women, which is about 98 families. Um, but this particular group, of 26 ranged in age from 21 to 43. Um, they had a mean number of about a little over three children. Uh, for data analysis, um, there were copious um, field notes, interview transcripts, family profiles. Um, and family profiles were kind of like a rough summary of what was going on in each family that included information from the field notes. Um, and what we did was I had um, a group of students that I was working with who created case studies for each family, looking at the field notes, interview transcripts. Um, we wrote memos for the families in Chicago. Um, we're in the process of developing a coding scheme, moving on to actually coding, um, and then um, undergoing kind of systematic uh, coding and um, uh, identifying themes and patterns. So we're kind of like in a preliminary uh, stage right now. So everything that I'll pr present to you um, is really cursory and um, kind of preliminary. So the first thing that I'll talk about is sort of the nature of work that um, the women in the study um, were engaged in. Most I would say had a series of low-wage part-time jobs, um, and these jobs were interspersed with periods of unemployment. There were very few um, who had stable jobs or full-time employment. Um, I can think of maybe one or two of the 26 who had stable jobs or full-time employment. Um, and when it comes to the working conditions, a lot of what we um, were able to see really mimics was out in the larger literature. So women were working for low wages. Um, they didn't have any type of paid leave, so no vacation leave, no medical leave, uh, parental leave. And um, I'll talk about sort of the impact of not having uh, paid leave in a bit. Um, oftentimes the women had very long or complicated commutes. So um, commutes that were one and a half to two hours one way, um, having to take um, two and three buses to get to a job. Uh, many of them also worked non-standard hours, so graveyard shift and third shift, um, or had these unpredictable work schedules where on a weekly basis, they would kind of find out their schedule or be called into work at different times. Um, also, there's an issue of workplace safety, but not necessarily in the way that I think people um, think about 
workplace safety traditionally. Um, so for our families, their actual work environment may be in um, a dangerous neighborhood. Um, so for example, we have families who are working for the um, Chicago Housing Authority, um, and there's always, um, I won't say always, but sometimes uh, shootings around where they work. Um, one of our, the women in our study had a bullet come through her office while she was at work. Um, so I'll move on to some of the reasons that women are entering and exiting the, work the workplace. Um, so some of this is around firing. Uh, we have some women who are um, fired when they get pregnant. Um, the issue of um, not having leave comes up um, because um, sometimes women have, uh, will have pregnancy complications that require them to take time off, but they don't get paid for having time off, and if they take time off, they can be fired for their jobs. Um, women enter and exit around childbirth. Um, and some of entering and exiting has to do with a lack of child care. That's a, that's a really big issue. Um, things like transportation, again, um, when people, uh, women have to take those very long, complicated commutes that usually doesn't last long and it's usually unsustainable, sorry. Um, other things that affect um, entering and exiting the workplace are things like negative life events. Um, if you look at the literature on negative life events, uh, people who are low income experience more negative life events. All of these variety of things that can go wrong in your life that impact your ability to work. Um, and that's related to sort of this stress proliferation where um, one thing will go wrong or one negative event will happen and it'll kind of lead to this snowball of negative life events. Other things that come up for our families are homelessness. So not having a stable place to live and how that impacts their ability um, to work and maintain a job. Um, as in the traditional work and family literature, you see issues with work family conflict within our families as well. Um, so this, I'm defining it here as when work interferes with family or vice versa. Um, so some of the family related stressors that we see are um, sick children, and then that goes back to not having uh, paid leave, lack of social support. The women who seem to do the, the best um, actually have supportive um, family members, um, people that they can rely on for housing and things like that. Um, also an issue that kind of surprised me that comes up is this imposition of uh, traditional uh, gender norms and how that creates conflicts in households. So some of the women in the study have partners who um, kind of insist on these traditional gender roles, but they really don't have a traditional um, situation where um, you know the male is the breadwinner, but they kind of want to impose that on the household um, despite the fact that the woman might be the actual breadwinner, might be working two jobs, et cetera. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is we started off looking at formal work, um, but discovered that women have all types of what we're calling side hustles, so um, informal forms of employment um, that brings in extra income. Um, and sometimes it's a matter of having difficulty balancing formal work, education, as well as side hustles. So some women have to choose between all those things. Um, and some of the most common side hustles, I would say, are things like hairstyling, babysitting, um, but there's also some side hustles that I would say are less common, but people also sell drugs, prostitution, sell food stamps, and things like that. Um, some of the reasons for side hustles are um, wanting a better life, 
Uh, we have some women who are really, I would characterize them as entrepreneurs who want to start businesses. Um, so they're selling lotions and soaps and gift baskets. Um, and there's also women who do it more um, on an as-needed basis where they are um, trying to get extra money for things like their children's activities that come up um, and field trips, things like that. Um, and it's a way of earning extra money without um, encountering sanctions or having your benefits cut. So this is um, an ethnographer speaking about a woman named Dahlia who's age 30. She said, Dahl Dahlia said, I make a lot of money braiding hair and I don't want to admit to it. She said that she did not want to talk about it, and I assured her that it was her right not to talk about something if she did not want to. She asked me to cross it off of the chart, which I did. So they were filling out a chart about her income sources and work, and she asked the ethnographer to cross that part out, but she was saying that she does make money from um, hair braiding. Um, just quickly moving on to education, many participants do not have high school diplomas or GEDs, uh, but the majority are participating in um, educational uh, certificate programs pertaining to nursing or healthcare. Um, they kind of frequently switch between different fields because of some of these programs are really short term. Um, uh, but when it comes to education, TANF really restricts how much education and training counts towards the work requirement. So families are, in a sense, trying to be upwardly mobile through education, but there are restrictions imposed by TANF on um, how much time they can actually spend on education and um, how much time they have to spend at work. So something like higher education is particularly difficult. Um, so, like work, uh, participants are frequently entering and exiting uh, educational programs for a variety of reasons. Um, their, their trajectories are really nonlinear, um, and they're struggling to balance work, family, and education. Um, and oftentimes, they have to choose among those things. Um, and um, safety can sometimes play a role in uh, continuing education. Um, so here's one example of Nadine, age 25. She says, I always was a full-time student. Even when I was working, it was stressful. That's why I left, because I mean, trying to work in school and the kids, I was like, I was like, all day, every day. I couldn't stand it, seven days a week. I was like that from the time I started working in 2000 when I came back in January. It was, oh my God, I just got tired of it. Uh, it was, I was fortunate to have gotten approved for Section 8 last year, and since I knew I didn't have to worry about the rent, that gave me all, uh, all the more reason to stop working. And I'm like, I only have a year left, and a year and a half left of school, so why not? So this was an example who, uh, of a person who at a particular time was choosing to focus on their education. One of the things that I'll just wrap up by saying, because I know that I am out of time, is that um, welfare itself can actually be a very disruptive force in people's lives. On the one hand, they, um, when it's available, they um, get access to um, you know, different benefits. But we have many women in the, our study whose benefits are uh, who are sanctioned at different points, whose benefits are cut off um, for various reasons. So it's almost like a part-time job to manage welfare benefits. Um, and a lot of it um, has to do with the actual disorganization on the part of the welfare office. Um, so uh, people will get letters for an appointment on Friday that was, and their appointment was on the previous Monday. So things like that, and it's not just one case. Um, letters and paperwork will get lost. Um, and these sanctions actually result in, or they can result in people 
being without cash assistance, food stamps, or different other benefit, benefits for months at a time. Um, so it's a, it can be very disruptive and um, kind of um, unstable, unpredictable things in people's lives. I just want to close by just acknowledging a few people. Um, the data that I presented to you today, um, um, the PI of the study is an ethnographer and sociologist who, her name is Linda Burton. Um, actually worked on, the, worked on this project when I was an undergraduate student, and she allowed me to come back 20 years later um, and do this data analysis. I also want to thank the students um, who worked on the project, the participating families, um, as well as um, a research and scholarship award from the graduate school um, that allowed me to do some of this work over the summer. Thank you. I'm new to glasses, so I don't know if I need them yet. So that's why I have them nearby. Um, apologies. <laughs> um, hi, my name is uh, Dawn Down. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Maryland. Um, and I want to thank um, the Baha'i Chair for World Peace, for Dr. Mulmoody for uh, inviting me, and Dr. Seaman for organizing this event together. Um, it's been a wonderful two days of empowerment and thought-provoking presentations. So I look forward to a sort of robust Q&A after this presentation. So today I'll be presenting a portion of a chapter of my recent book, Mothering While Black, Boundaries and Burdens of Middle Class Motherhood. Um, I became interested in this topic because of what I saw as a regular omission of black or African American mothers from both academic research and public discourse on middle class mothers. Let me go to the next slide actually to show you this picture. Um, so often those discussions primarily are, are exclusively focused on the experiences of white middle class women, at times noting that black women seem to feel or think differently about work family issues and at times do different things, but often noted as an aside and not the crux of the, the, the um, investigation. So despite the important contributions of this commentary and, its re and the research, it failed to adequately capture the experiences of African American middle and upper middle class mothers. This research has often focused on commonalities resulting from similarities across class rather than exploring how race and gender complicate mothering experiences. My research sort of began with a curiosity about how African American middle class mothers approach parenting, family, and work, and how race, class, and gender influence those approaches. I focused on mothers because they are often primarily responsible for socializing young children, and previous research has found that African American mothers are also more likely to engage in the racial socialization of younger children. I also wanted to center the experiences of African American mothers, and I focused on middle and upper middle class mothers because this group typically has more resources to address discrimination than do lower income African American mothers, so we might have a clearer picture of how gender and race impact parenting practices with resources to actually have choice in those, in those situations. So the book, I'll just give you a little preview of the book as a teaser in case any of you are interested in reading the whole thing. It's divided into two parts, two main parts. The first part examines the parenting practices and perspectives of black middle class mothers. It engages with dominant frameworks that examine how economic resources impact middle class parenting practices. Um, and this is a, a framework that where they think class and things related to it like education and occupation um, are more important factors in influencing how parents approach raising their children, and other factors like racial identity are viewed as less important. Um, this approach, often referred to as conservative cultivation, emphasizes encouraging children's logical reasoning, developing children's intellectual and uh, uh, physical skills through organized enrichment activities, and viewing educational and other institutions in society from an entitlements and service-oriented perspective. Um, I'm happy to talk about part two in the Q&A, but I'm not talking about it today. It examines African-American middle-class mothers' approaches to family and work and childcare and engages frameworks that see society as separate spheres that are divided along gender lines 
and pu the public sphere of, of men in the workplace and a private sphere of women in the home. Now, modern versions of this ide idea in sociology include the framework of competing devotions, which views working outside of the home as conflicting with being a mother, and intensive mothering, which views child rearing as an exclusive or primary duty of mothers, um, and mothering as an all-consuming, time-intensive activity that occurs within a nuclear family context. My research suggests that all mothers are not equally shaped by these frameworks or ideologies of motherhood. So today's presentation, um, I'm gonna focus on two questions. How does gender impact the challenges African-American middle-class mothers believe their children will confront? Um, and what strategies do they use to help their sons and daughters navigate these, these challenges? So um, when we examine parenting, some scholars suggest that class is key in determining how parents raise their children. And the often when scholars are talking about African-American mothers, often they're just talking about whether or not it's a race or class um, uh, perspective that influences um, parenting. It's an either or proposition. So I explore how intersections of race, class, and gender complicate the experiences of members of the expanding African-American middle class, particularly as it relates to family work and parenting. These intersections combined with what I call societal reception in this uh, model um, influence the concerns parents have and the strategies they use to address those, those concerns. Research on families has often focused on characteristics that are internal to them, such as income, cultural traditions, family structure, and education. But I suggest that part of unpacking how and why African-American middle-class mothers approach raising their children in the ways that they do requires that we examine how these mothers and their children are differently received, or at least how they perceive themselves to be received in the broader white and mainstream society. And I've called this societal reception. Now, critical whiteness scholars such as Wise and McIntosh tell us part of the dominant experience of being white and a middle-class family is not regularly or explicitly thinking about racial identity and how it informs parental concerns or decision-making. African-American middle-class families do not generally share that luxury. Indeed, there is an abundance of evidence that middle-class African-Americans continue to face discrimination in housing, educational settings, employment, healthcare, and, in and interactions with law enforcement. These forms of discrimination prevent middle-class African-Americans from fully reaping the benefits of their middle-class resources. So just to provide some background about methods, um, this is a little quick slide. Um, the book is based on 60 in-depth, semi-structured interviews of African-American middle and upper-class mothers living in the San Francisco Bay Area who were recruited to the study using a modified snowball sample. I reached out to a number of organizations, parenting organizations, religious organizations, to recruit them. Um, the interviews were conducted between 2009 and 2011. All participants were raising at least one child that was age 10 or younger, and middle class status was determined by a combination of education and total family income. Participants had attended college for at least two years, um, and their total family income ranged from 50,000 to 300,000. Now, the upper end of this income probably sounds high to a lot of you guys. Um, however, in the San Francisco Bay Area between 2006 and 2010, the median owner-occupied home value was $637,000. Home ownership is an important marker of middle-class status. Uh, participants in the upper end of this income range were often among the few who could easily attain that marker. Um, I should also say that I was making this decision around the time that Obama was trying to decide what was going to be the cutoff for the middle class, the increased tax rate for quote unquote middle class families. And he was debating between $250,000 and $300,000 at the time. So I took the higher um, uh, amount. And so there might be a couple people in the samples who might be more better, better described as upper class as opposed to upper middle class. Um, the majority of participants, three quarter, were married. Participants' ages ranged from 25 to 49, and the majority, 63%, earned advanced degrees, such as middle, um, an MD, JD, PhD, or MA, with 27% earning a college degree and 10% attending some college. Half were home owners and half were renters. So um, this is an educated and relatively privileged group of women who are discussing their parenting and their strategies. Um, so the African-American mothers in this research had concerns that they shared for sons and daughters, but in this presentation, I'll be focusing on those concerns that differed based on intersections of race and gender. I also want to highlight that the gendered and racialized context in which this research was conducted differed by gender and seemed to inform and animate these mothers' concerns and parenting practices. So in terms of sons, 
This research was bookended by two shooting deaths of unarmed African-American males. The first, Oscar Grant, and the second, Trayvon Martin. As you may recall, on New Year's Day 2010, Johannes Marsley, a white Bay Area rapid uh, tra transit police officer in Oakland, fatally shot Oscar Grant, a young African-American man in the back. During the incident, Mr. Grant was unarmed, laying face down on the train platform, and had been subdued by several other officers. On July 8, 2010, Measurely was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter, not the higher charge of second-degree murder or voluntary manslaughter. On February 12, 2012, Trayvon Martin was pursued, shot, and killed by George Zimmerman, a neighborhood watch coordinator, while walking home from a convenience store in his father's safe, gated, middle-class community. Despite being a child from that middle-class community, it was not safe for Martin. Zimmerman was initially released from custody without being charged on Florida Stand Your Ground laws. It took a national movement, weeks of pressure from the public and, and media, and a special investigator finally to file charges against him. On July 13, Zimmerman was found not guilty of second-degree murder or the lesser charge of manslaughter. So I tell you this because these were some of the, particularly Oscar Grant stories, sometimes raised during interviews and people were talking about the concerns they had for their, for their children. Um, now there have been numerous additional shooting deaths of unarmed African-American boys and men by police and members of the public. And increasingly, African-American parents are sharing their concerns for their son's safety. And I show these images of unarmed African-American boys and men who were killed over the last few years to underscore that this is a societal context that animates African-American middle-class mothers' concerns and parenting practices regarding their sons. The social context for daughters during the time I was doing this research was somewhat different. So uh, although mothers believed their daughters were barraged with messages that they were unworthy, unattractive, because they did not have the right skin color, facial features, or hair textures, many of the mother same mothers also mentioned examples of relatively more positive depictions of African-American women that were available to their daughters. As this research began, Michelle Obama became the first African-American first lady, and the Disney's Princess Frog featuring the first African-American princess was released. Some mothers in my sample described organizing viewings of this movie with other African-American mothers and their children. Over, the t over time, over the time these interviews were conducted, there was a music video, I Love My Hair, that was produced by Sesame Street and went viral among both children and women. Um, in this video, an African-American girl was encouraged to love her hair in all of its natural forms. Malia Obama sported cornrows and twists, which decreased the stigma of those hairstyles and encouraged some mothers in my research to be more willing to have their daughters wear them. And so we might think that these, these, um, these ideas about hair and beauty are superficial, but African-American women's beauty and hair has confronted a surprising amount of scrutiny. Military schools and, and company policies have outlawed certain natural hairstyles for women. African-American women's experience, appearance has been discussed and debated, and there have been attempts to regulate it by various societal institutions. As these mothers' accounts reveal, they felt their daughters were bombarded by messages from the mainstream media that black women were not beautiful or valued. These, differences, these different social contexts influence mothers' concerns. I interviewed, um, I interviewed Karen, a married mother, while she nursed her child in her apartment. Karen let, let out a de deep sigh before describing how she felt when she learned her baby's gender. She said, I was thrilled the baby wasn't a boy. I think it is hard to be a black girl and a black woman in America, but I think it's dangerous and sometimes deadly to be a black boy and a black man. Oscar Grant and beyond, there are lots of dangerous interactions with police and urban areas for black men. So I was very nervous because we thought she was a boy. I was relieved when she wasn't. It's terrible, but it's true. Now, Karen's relief upon learning her child was not a boy underscores how intersections of racial identity, class, and gender influence parenting concerns and practices. Her comments also speak to the different quality of concerns mothers had for sons versus th those that they had for daughters, and underscores how processes that are occurring at the macro level have an impact at the micro level. The concerns that mothers had for their daughters were also shaped by race and gender, but they were different, and for many seemed more manageable. For example, another mother, um, who had previously described in our interview her concerns for her son's safety, um, her name was Carlin, and I asked her about her concerns for her daughter, and she said, not as many. I think, um, you know, not as many. I don't know, it just feels as though it's a little easier for her to do what she needs to do and be who she needs to be because she is perceived as less of a threat and than he will be. Carlin's concerns for her daughter focused on ensuring she had a strong self-esteem, was educated, and could take care of herself. The challenges daughters would face often seemed less onerous because unlike their sons, these mothers did not worry about sending their daughters into a world 
where they would be perceived as a physical threat that needed to be contained. Mothers were primarily concerned with their son's safety and preventing them from being criminalized as thugs and were primarily concerned with protecting and strengthening their daughter's self-esteem and self-value. Mothers I interviewed were keenly aware of the assumptions about propensities towards violence and illegal behavior that were attached to their African-American sons. And despite being middle and upper middle class, they also felt limited in their ability to protect their sons from this reality. Mary, a married mother of a son and daughter, described a conversation that regularly occurred in her mother's group, revealing her worries about adequately preparing her son. She said, with our sons, we talk about how we can prepare them or teach them about how to deal with a society, especially in a community like Oakland, where black men are held to a different standard than others, and not necessarily a better one. So there are some assumptions and beliefs that are placed on them just by physically looking at them that, can't hold them that can hold them back. When you're a black man and you get stopped by the policeman, you can't do the same thing the white person would do because they might already have some preconceived notions and that might get you into a heap more trouble. We talk about our sons who are a little younger and starting kindergarten. What do we have to do to make, our, make sure teachers don't have preconceived ideas that stop our sons from learning because they believe little brown boys are more rambunctious or little brown boys are hitting more than Caucasian boys. So middle class mothers are typically depicted as viewing educators and law enforcement as resources. But these mothers viewed these groups as threats and sources of gendered racism for their sons and daughters. Sending their children out into the world and to school was a source of stress. They viewed police as potential predators and teachers as potential tyrants. Nia, a married mother of two sons, described interactions with other families at local children's activities that she called baby racism and underscored how concerns about criminalization emerged early in her children's lives. From the time our son was a baby and we, could, we would go to different children's activities, our son would go and hug a kid and, parent, and a parent would grab him and, and be like, oh, he's going to attack him. And it was just like, really, are you serious? He was actually gonna give him a hug. You see, like baby racism. I've even written to local parenting listeners to ask and I'm, and, and, and I'm imagine, am I imagining this? And the response was interesting. Almost all of the black mothers wrote in, you're not imagining this, this is real, you're going to have to spend the rest of your life fighting for your child. Nia, like other participants, believed that when African American boys participated in activities, their behavior faced greater scrutiny and stigma. Participants also worried about the toll of these images on their sons and the type of self-perception that they might uh, cultivate as they transition to manhood based upon the societal expectations of them. So it's important to reiterate that these are middle and upper middle class mothers and families. These are the sorts of households that on paper would seem to exemplify middle class resources and privileges and would one would assume would have access to good schools, dedicated teachers, and safe neighborhoods. But these participants saw teachers and educators and law enforcement as potential threats to their son's development and safety. Now, when Mary mentioned above, described the concern she had for her, about her daughter, her focus shifted. Sorry. Um, one of the things she's talked about was, one of the things we talk about in the group is what are some of the challenges we faced, that we believe our children are going to face and how we can prepare them. Whether it's I'm the only black girl in the school or someone is wondering why my hair is curly or is telling me I look like a monkey because it doesn't straighten like theirs. How can we prepare them? How can we instill in them a sense of beauty and sense of pride in who they are? Mary's comments illustrate concerns for her daughter and um, her desire to have her learn um, her own value and worth as an African-American mother. This was something Mary later stated she did not believe was reflected in the messages her daughter received from the broader society. So I want to talk about some of the strategies that mothers use to counter some of these challenges. So for, in terms of dealing with people's social interactions, mothers try to approach um, dealing with these issues using ex something I called experience management, which focused on, um, which focused on uh, trying to um, seek out opportunities for their children to have exposure to healthy versions of black masculinity where their sons could learn how to navigate being black men. For, they also use a version of uh, what I call environment management, where they tried to make sure that their communities were, were free of racism and that their kids were able to be in a setting where they had sort of scrutinized to make sure they weren't having interactions with folks who were going to judge them based on their race. For their daughters, they often focused on trying to cultivate a peer group that would support them and that looked like them and that would reaffirm their value and their beauty. 
Um, so this is the sort of social interaction management that mothers did with their children. In terms of their sons, I'm going to skip ahead because I would love to give you more examples, but I'm running out of time, I know. Um, in terms of demeanor, um, mothers talked about trying to manage their son's emotions, right? So they knew that their sons could not um, interact with people in the world in the same way as their white male counterparts and focused on putting them in yoga classes so that they would be able to control how they experienced ex things during the day and have a calm demeanor. Um, and again, image management told their sons that they shouldn't wear a hoodie because even though they thought this was unfair and that they shouldn't have to manage themselves in this way, felt that it was something that might diminish the likelihood that they would be stopped by the police or harassed at school in some way. Now, I should say that people, mothers also talked about image management with their daughters, but the consequences were different. They were concerned that their daughters might be viewed as quote unquote ghetto or they had unruly parents. They weren't as concerned about their daughters being killed because they were wearing an outfit. Um, the last two things I want to talk about uh, uh, are more focused on daughters and their experiences. Let's skip ahead, sorry. Um, I'm going the wrong direction. Um, <laughs> sorry. I'm going to get there. It was uh, media management and toy management. So media management, are, these are kind of related concepts. But for example, you can see here, mothers were really interested in trying to expose their young children to uh, positive images of, in books and in cartoons and in media, the princess frog of, of, of black women and brown women. One mother talked about encouraging her daughter to watch Dora because Dora was at least brown and was running around and you know, trying to see the world. Um, and people also talked about this in terms of buying toys for their, for their children as well, their daughters in particular. So making sure that their daughter had um, exposure to black and brown Barbie dolls or black and brown baby dolls, right? And one, one mother had a very poignant story about her daughter going to a childcare and finding the lone, the lone doll and, um, and picking it up and scooping it, it up and extolling it to all of her white classmates in terms of how beautiful it was. And then that daycare having to go off and buy more black baby dolls because the children started to have disputes about that, 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 that doll, right? So um, a very positive change that she wasn't certain would have happened had she not supported her. But I'm gonna sum up with my last slide here, which is my uh, discussion and conclusion slide. Um, so these mothers were basically encouraging their children at time to engage in strategic sacrifices and expression, right, of their race and their identity because of concerns that they had about how they would be navigating the world. Um, they felt as though they had to be constrained in their expressions of race and often had to understand how society viewed them in a negative way but also simultaneously cultivate a more positive image of themselves for themselves, a version of what W.E.B. Du Bois would call um, double consciousness. Um, Ironically, a lot of the mothers um, in doing this and knowing that their children had to act differently were kind of compelled to reproduce a sense of inequality in society because telling your child that you have to act differently and they act differently and then because they receive differently is reaffirming that process. Um, having said that, these mothers were trying to protect the spirit of their children the, the bodies of their sons and the self-esteem of their daughters. Thank you. I'm sorry I went over. That's great. I'm so happy to be on this panel. Thank you uh, so much for inviting me to the conference. Uh, Hoda for the invitation, Kate also for the, uh, the great organizing work that you did and, and everybody for being here. But it's, it's um, especially nice to be on this panel and follow because I think so much of the context for what I'm gonna talk about has been made really clear already. Um, so let me get my... Here it is. I found it. Yeah. Got it. Here's an interview from, we'll go from the start. Or it doesn't actually matter. 
Okay. In a military courtroom at Fort Benning, Georgia, on March 15, 1971, prosecutors made their closing arguments against Lieutenant William Calley for the most notorious massacre of the Vietnam War. Three years earlier, dozens of U.S. soldiers had murdered, raped, and or mutilated scores of unarmed civilians of all ages in the Vietnamese hamlet of My Lai. Though more than 100 men participated in the atrocities, Cali was the only person ever convicted. The brutality and scale of the violence at My Lai were beyond belief to most Americans at the time, but an explanation of sorts could be found on the front page of the Washington Post as the events unfolded. Nestled alongside an article reporting Callie's trial was a second article proclaiming army psychiatrists are studying the relationship between male sex hormones and aggression to find a way to keep irrational killers out of the military. Now, no one was directly saying that this particular war crime could be chalked up to a ferocious case of testosterone poisoning, but the juxtaposition of the articles, and in fact, as you see, it's, it's tucked in, in between. This, this article about testosterone and aggression is tucked in between two different um, reports about the My Lai atrocities. Um, and, and the specific quotes from the research psychiatrists about their studies definitely alluded to a connection between testosterone and the massacre. One of them said, we're trying to weed out people who can't handle their aggressions, people who are so aggressive that they haven't learned how to control it. This was Dr. Robert Rose, one of the psychiatrists whose work was featured in the report. My talk today is, is based on my new book, Testosterone, an Unauthorized Biography, co-written with Katrina Carcasis and coming out next month, October 15th, in fact. In this unauthorized biography of testosterone, we start with the observation that testosterone is a fascinating character with a double life. One as a molecule, a steroid hormone with a precise chemical structure, and the other as an outsized cultural figure who gets blamed and praised for a huge array of phenomena that are considered to be the virtues and vices of men. Typically, people think of scientific approaches to tea, and I'm going to use testosterone's nickname tea through most of the talk. So the scientific work is supposedly the place for precision. It should be that. And we might think that any resonance between scientific claims and cultural stories comes about because the cultural stories are to some extent grounded in a material reality of what this hormone does. But our work and the work of many other feminist science and technology studies scholars and feminist scientists um, has shown, we're working in a long tradition, um, shows a much messier relationship between these realms, which isn't in itself surprising, but it's still, it was important to do this because the authorized biography of testosterone, the idea is that it's the male sex hormone, for example, that it drives aggression and violence, that it makes people bold risk takers. It, it determines both who is out of control and also who's on top in social hierarchies, that it drives both sexual longing and sexual violence and more. That authorized familiar version of tea is so powerful that Katrina and I decided it was worth taking a close look at the scientific evidence and the cultural stories, how they're woven together in these particular domains that I mentioned, to see how that science connects to the cultural stories and what kinds of social effects the specific concrete claims about tea have right now. Now, even people who are skeptical about attributing social problems to biology in most realms, people who, for example, might be skeptical of the idea that women occupy an inferior social and political position to men because of some eternal facts about our brains, as Daphne Joel said this morning, it completely took apart that idea, or because of hormones out of control. Too often, these same people, that is us, may casually refer to, quote, too much testosterone as the reason for bad behavior. Um, this is a great example recently in discussing in uh, the, the, the magazine The Cut, the online um, uh, uh, venue, the very you know, interesting progressive thinkers, very casually, maybe it was tongue in cheek when asking about when Rebecca Traster says, honest to God, what is wrong with people? 
And Ross responds, mostly testosterone, apparently. Maybe it's a joke, maybe it's tongue in cheek, but it's part of what keeps the narrative going. It reiterates this idea. And it's a strong thrum of this notion that we just can't get around it. This is just the way we are. This is just how things are gonna be. So one of the most enduring stories, of course, about testosterone is this notion um, that it drives violent aggression. The association obviously didn't start with the My Lai massacre, but I began with the Washington Post's pairing of Callie's trial and Robert Rose's research because it's a great example of how the scientific enterprise is part and parcel of the larger social and political world and because it really beautifully illustrates how scientific facts, once they get established, are very, very difficult to dislodge. Once it is the case that something has been established, that just keeps rolling forward, even often with the same old citation, gaining more and more and more hundreds of citations. Um, this study, uh, not to mention the wildly misleading association of the study with the massacre, would be unlikely to make it into print today. Yet the study's central finding was this, that high levels of testosterone are related to, quote, more serious offending or, quote, quote more violent crimes among criminals. That claim has shed its embarrassing origins in a very badly flawed study, and it lives on as a simple empirical truth. It's no longer weighed down by the specifics of a study that doesn't match the methods and theories of contemporary endocrinology or behavioral research. It's, it's out there already. It's really hard to get that genie back in the bottle. So the foundational studies on tea and human aggression date to a roughly 30-year period from the 1970s through the 1990s. These studies are where you'll find grand claims that higher tea levels have been found in violent criminals and others whose behavior is, quote, antisocial and specifically aggressive. Later studies, especially lab research, measuring subtle aggressive, aggressive actions like punishing another player in a computer game, the kinds of things that are published right now, are layered upon these foundations and they're citing them. Those, those old studies are embedded in the newer stuff um, in a way that seems to extend the connection between testosterone and outright violence to very um, minor hostilities and the notion that a whole array of bad behaviors can be traced to the effects of this hormone. Now, contemporary scientists tend to shy away from bold claims that tea causes aggression, at least on its own. They also increasingly acknowledge that tea responds to behavior in social situations. In other words, when we face particular kinds of social challenges or changes in status, and in particular, um, stress has been studied a lot, or participate in certain kinds of physical activities, like intense exercise, especially weight-bearing exercise, or complex emotional and physical interactions, like sexual behavior. Our bodies very often respond by either increasing or decreasing our production of tea. And these are very dramatic responses. Um, some of the scientists we talked to when we were doing the book um, described very short intervention studies that they did with athletes where they were trying to do what you might think of as a, a legal, a non-doping way to get uh, testosterone up in athletes because at that time they thought that was going to help the athletes. That's another whole story. It didn't actually help them. But they wanted to get the athletes' uh, T levels up, so they did these short interventions and they came up with interventions that without touching a person, just by talking to them, giving an interaction, they could reliably double the testosterone production in a very short period of time. So these models are now very dynamic. They're not the old static models. The idea isn't just you're born with it and you go with it. But even with this dynamism, this old idea about the testosterone itself having a particular kind of character, a certain set of programs of behaviors that it's going to bestow on people is still in that model. And, and the notion of T creating a hostile or aggressive disposition or violent behavior is one of those important ideas. So the fact that the important studies on criminal violence and testosterone use an outdated model of physiology and behavior is only one of the reasons to suspect they shouldn't still be influential. Another is this, double-blind, 
placebo-controlled studies in which neither the investigator nor the participants know who's getting tea versus an inert substance are the gold standard for establishing what tea does. And such studies have consistently found tea to have no effect on aggressive behavior or feelings. A number of such studies have involved raising tea to supraphysiological levels, meaning it's well beyond the upper limit uh, that you, of the range that's seen in healthy men. And have also included asking not just the men in the studies, but their significant others to report on the men's mood and behavior over the time period where, get, where they're getting the hormone. No effect on aggression, anger, or hostility in real world situations and interactions has been observed in studies that have used this design. That's huge. That's not what people typically expect. But at present, researchers still often read the overwhelmingly negative evidence on tea and human aggression as, quote, weak and inconsistent instead of as negative. And they see this as an intriguing puzzle rather than an indication that they're going down a dead end street. So why is that? What's, what's going on here? And, and in the book, we look at the interplay between studies of tea and aggression on the one hand and concurrent public discourse on violence as a social problem, especially the class and race politics of violence. From the beginning, the science and scientific narratives that link tea to aggression have been about both individual bodies and broad social problems or trends. Why are men violently aggressive more often than women? How can the military weed out overly aggressive soldiers? How to know who is destined to be a violent recidivist versus a person who might be rehabilitated? These aren't mere matters of scientific interest. They're political, social questions. Testosterone right now has figured in discussions of one of the most explosive issues of our times, and that's the highly racialized interplay between violent crime and the use of excessive police force against unarmed civilians, especially against black men and other men and women of color. In a neatly drawn parallel, high T is seen as driving both violent crime and the rampant overuse of force in policing. And I don't have the time to take you through all the, the details of the various places where this narrative has shown up. Um, we do that in the book, but what we do more is actually drill down to the studies that keep on getting these little side passing references to the studies that seem to anchor this in reality. Um, but uh, for two decades, as one example, Alan Mazur, I hope I'll have time at the end to talk about him a little bit more. He's a sociologist. He's an elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which is a prestigious group. For more than two decades, he has claimed that high T levels in young black men might explain broad social patterns of crime, such as the FBI statistics for the United States in 2013 that show 38% of murderers convicted people convicted of murder were, quote, known to be black, and 51% of victims were black. So I want to pause and just say this is a sociologist who instead of taking into account the, everything that we know, the vast, vast data on the social structure of policing, of surveillance, of where are the police happening, what are the kinds of stresses that are going on in particular communities, how do police escalate very often, how, how do many circumstances in marginal communities escalate crime and so on. How do we know, for example, there have always been massive disparities at every step of the criminal justice process from the uh, initial step of policing that often can ramp up stress and hostility in a neighborhood instead of tamping it down, depending on how that's done, to then once there is a crime, the disparity in the likelihood that someone uh, who's a person of color will be arrested for that crime, then the disparities in how that crime gets discharged so that there are great racial disparities in conviction rates and then in great racial disparities in sentencing rates. So all of that is shaping this and that just disappears behind a theory that is about different biologies uh, among the people who are are supposedly overwhelmingly responsible for aggression and violence. Um, I, I'm going to come back to it because there's a way in which Mazur and others appear to be using this reciprocal model and talk about 
um, challenges, social challenges, as being the thing that raises testosterone that then puts into motion higher levels of violence. But what we show in the book is that it's not really using that reciprocal model because, in fact, within the way that they describe the studies and do the studies, the challenges that are generated come inherently from a presumed hostility and chaotic nature of black communities themselves. They never so much as allude to any of the broader social processes that, that put people under stress, which can in fact raise testosterone. But these studies um, have a whole logic that is about locating the cause of violence within the bodies of men and in specifically black men. So I'll, I, I don't have a whole lot of time. I'm going to keep going and tell you about um, uh, a link with, with social class as well. So the, the studies are, are a little bit old, but it's worth looking at them because they're the classics. They're the foundations. They're still being used. They're cited in criminology textbooks. They're cited in in um, biology textbooks, sociology, psychology, uh, and in the ongoing literature in behavioral biology. So uh, one of the biggest uh, researchers on all of this was James Dabbs. James Dabbs um, was a, one, a social psychologist who was one of the most engaging writers and speakers to ever turn his attention to testosterone. He was a very, very interesting guy. And so he was a, he was a passionate researcher. He sometimes loved to debunk myths about testosterone. So it's more than a little ironic that his work on testosterone among prisoners and among people of different occupations helped to solidify two really big myths, one about testosterone and criminal violence, and the other, the idea that people occupy the social class position they occupy because of testosterone. Um, so one of his best known studies is a 1987 study of men in a Georgia prison that supposedly um, showed this uh, fact that higher, that more violent offenders had higher T levels than nonviolent offenders. It built on that study that was linked with the My Lai massacre in various ways, but it looked better, it looked bigger, it looked more rigorously done. Um, but there were huge problems with it, including, I don't know how many of you know anything about statistics, but they did more than 51 comparisons. There were so many variables and so many comparisons. So there were 89 men in the study. They did 51 uh, different comparisons at least, and they found four statistically significant associations, three of them applying only to subgroups in the analysis. In other words, it's, they, didn't even, they found barely what you might expect by complete random chance. There's no reason to think that there's anything in here that is a valid association. They also failed to uh, control for one of the most obvious things, which is age, because they're comparing a whole group of men in prison, younger men. There's a longstanding acknowledgment that, that age um, uh, is very associated with the type of crime, and that um, uh, what they found was that the older men, uh, everybody has seen this in their studies, older men, in fact, um, have less violent crimes. If you look at an overall prison population, testosterone decreases with age, especially in American populations. So what you have here is what we would call a spurious correlation. The link between crime, violence, violent crime, and T is actually explained by the decrease in T over time and that's linked with age. So I could go through a lot more of those associations, but that's, that's the main one I just wanted to, to point out. Um, Dabbs also was one of the most important people to point, even against his own studies, say, well, you know, crime is a uniquely human construct, and if we want to connect this with animal research, we need to go to other things. So they came up with the idea that antisocial behavior, more generally, was the thing that was linked to testosterone. And so here, this shows you this massive study. Um, this particular study, I believe, I'm forgetting right now, but I'm pretty sure that this um, is a study of military veterans. And there are, again, many, many things that should you would want to control, that they didn't actually control the variables. And the idea, I'll just give you a, a quote, when he uh, begins moving forward uh, out into the world to describe the implications of this. And his, he putting together his findings on prisoners with research on tea among people with different occupations. 
the, this idea that tea causes downward social mobility. In his words, quote, many men with high testosterone levels are too impatient and aggressive to find their ways to positions of responsible leadership, unquote. So um, the, the studies, the details of the studies stick with people much less than a quote like that with this idea and this notion that it's, uh, again, it's something that lodges inside a, a person that actually explains the social system. Instead of taking uh, um, what we can observe and know and measure about social dynamics, social structures, institutions, material differences into account, the, the causal model, it's not that, that, that society shapes and influences, but that individual people are, are like the little atoms that very predictably um, add up to a social structure. Um, I just wanna, this is a, it's a very broad sweep and introduction to the kinds of findings that we have in the book and, the, and why they actually matter. Um, if I, do, oh, okay, I'm out of time, so I don't have time to give you more details of the studies. You'll have to read the book. Um, but I just wanted to end with this to just, know that, that this is a zombie fact. Placebo-controlled studies show no consistent link between T and real-world violence, aggression, or hostility. Those T studies that do show an association between T and criminal violence are badly flawed. They're fatally flawed. Um, claims that T is associated with lower social class do not take account of the stresses and challenging situations that cause T to rise. So you have different physical activities in different occupations, for example. There are many, many, many things. Uh, it's also, those occupation studies are wildly idiosyncratic in terms of how they classify people. Those studies are also just uh, too messy to be trusted. And finally, studies that assert high T is behind racial patterns of crime um, begin, they're grounded on and they build into their methods the idea that black communities are chaotic disorderly places. And they actually do not test many of the associations that they assert at the end, but they look, they often have a narrative that seems both plausible and very contemporary because of using, claiming to use these reciprocal models, the so-called challenge hypothesis. So the idea that it's uh, challenges that are experienced in so-called inner city communities by young black men then would cause T to rise and cause them to be violent. But in fact, within these studies, the challenges are completely generated by the young men themselves to each other. Most of the variables in that whole causal chain are never actually measured, and nothing about the larger social system is taken into account. So they, the studies just can't be trusted to make these conclusions. And I'll just leave you with this. Let's kill the zombie. Talking about too much testosterone, talking about testosterone poisoning, even if we think we're joking, it's tongue in cheek. Next time somebody sort of halfway jokes and says to you, oh, I'm drowning in my house because there's too much testosterone. I have six older brothers and a two much older, but four I grew up with and I love my brothers, but I was all too happy to believe in testosterone poisoning. It, it, takes, a, it like, takes practice. It takes discipline, but it actually really matters. This seeps into our consciousness, and it's part of what makes us, on some level, believe and tell each other that the world is how it is because of our biologies, and that our stereotypes, our racial stereotypes, our class stereotypes, our sex stereotypes, are somehow grounded in something real and material. So let's just stop. Let's stop doing it. Let's call it out. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for uh, those amazing presentations. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, so we have five minutes for questions from the audience. So if anybody has a question, can you please approach one of the microphones? I just have a quote here and actually address uh, just this question you're saying. We, the idea that nature causes this behavior and we can go, uh, they can be changed, then I want you to put it into perspective. Mm -hmm. The world in the past has been ruled by force and man has dominated over women by reason of his more forceful, aggressive qualities, both of body and mind. But the scales are already shifting, force is losing its weight, 
and mental alertness institution, the spiritual qualities of love and service in which woman is strong are gaining ascendancy. Hence, the new age will be an age less masculine and more uh, permeated with the feminine ideals. Or to speak more exactly, will be an age in which the masculine and feminine elements of civilization will be more uh, properly balanced. Just, uh, I want to uh, maybe address this quote. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to. In contest with what you just may, said. May I ask, first of all, who, who wrote that or said that? Oh, this is a Baha'i quotation. I think they might have been uh, uh, Abdul Baha who is the prophet, who is the uh, son of the prophet, okay. founder of the Baha'i faith. Oh, great. Yes. It's a Baha'i quotation. Exactly. Okay. So, um, there, are, there are two parts to that that I would like to address. One part, um, and I think this is the part that I would like to hold up and, and uh, assert, and that is the, the idea that the qualities of human beings have too often been cut into, and that only some of our human qualities are validated, and often it's not the most productive and useful qualities. So the idea that, um, that force is and should be the characteristic that we most prize and allow to move forward, whether it's physical force or the idea of mental force, and just, just this notion that, that forcefulness and power is um, uh, a something to revere. Um, but I think very often in um, our attempts to address gender uh, injustice and gender inequality in the world, um, it's too easy to accept the idea that those qualities that have been uh, disrespected and devalued and marginalized, like, like love, like insight, like like human compassion, the ability to relate, to understand, et cetera, um, justice and fairness. I, I think at the same moment that we want absolutely to revere those qualities, I don't think it helps us to continue asserting that those are female qualities. And that um, we can use that metaphorically, we can use that historically, we can use that as an idea for the way in which men and women have been seen and characterized and valued. But I think that we shoot ourselves in the foot, quite literally, if we continue to say that these female qualities have to be done. We actually all have these qualities. Uh, Professor Joel's presentation this morning is, you know, it's really interesting. We know from so many different kinds of study and analysis that these are the, the qualities that all human beings have. So, um, in our um, desire and our eagerness to bring women on equal political and social footing with men and to change the world, I think it can be hard to let go of something that feels like this is the place where women have superiority, this is where we really shine. But I think we have to let go of that idea that these are our special qualities if we're going to really change the world. So we have time perhaps for one last question and then we'll have to to finish. I have more than one question. So is that bad? Um, okay, let me ask the first question, which I have, and that's to um, Cecily. Um, in your present, I, mean, I appreciate your, your, your presentation on um, African American families and the challenge of balancing work and family. That's like a really important topic. Um, but I was wondering, because you know, it's, I was just wondering about how these women who were trapped in many low-wage occupations, um, did you explore with them the whole um, kind of dynamic of resistance? For example, in many, uh, for example, uh, there's been across the country McDonald's workers, many of whom are women of color, who have come out against sexual harassment and mm -hmm. sexual violence and sexual discrimination in McDonald's. And so they, you know, they, they've been on NBC, CNN, and so forth. So, um, and in fact, some of the most prominent spokeswomen have been black women. So I was just wondering if you had explored that topic with some of the women that you interviewed. 
Well, so, not necessarily that one, but just other forms of resistance. It doesn't have to be sexual harassment. So um, this was actually a secondary data analysis. So I'm mm -hmm. analyzing data that um, has been collected um, about roughly 20 years ago or so. Uh, um, and I would say that that, um, uh, the idea of resistance wasn't really explored, um, but also I would say that it really didn't come up as I was reading uh, data from the families either. Because some things that weren't explicitly asked came up um, kind of in a topic of conversation. I think people probably had their individual ways of resisting, and some of that uh, could be something as simple as, I'm leaving this job who's not uh, because I'm not being treated right here. But it didn't seem like there were um, these sort of collective responses mm -hmm. or collective resistance. Yeah, because I would like to encourage you, because I think that you have this, you know, this desire to do this kind of work. I think, you know, documenting and really analyzing this kind of work is just so important because, you know, the news stations are very variable in terms of how they are going to report the resistance of women to the oppressive mechanisms of our society. And now let me just turn really quickly to a, um, a, a I'm no. sorry, I hate to cut the discussion short. No. Uh, I'm so sorry. But it's, it's such already, a good question. Unless there is time, is there time? I have, uh, I have here that we okay. have a next closing remarks of 12.45. Okay. okay. I, I have to leave. I personally have to leave to okay. teach, but if somebody can take my place. Yes. Perfect. Thank I just you. have one question for Don. Oh, I mean, okay. I have more than one. And that has to do with, in your study of middle class women, other research on middle class um, families have uh, really pointed, especially work by Arlie Hochschild and other mm -hmm. people, have really talked about the, the outsourcing mm -hmm. of much of the household labor and much of the child care, et cetera, um, with respect to this is how one mechanism whereby they are able um, just usually by utilizing the, um, uh, you know, especially migrant labor, et cetera, to, um, to thrive in professional occupations or at least to survive in occupational, you know, these uh, situations. Did you find that in your study? Um, well, um, I would say that certainly some mothers did use sort of um, uh, nanny care that wasn't the, or babysitters that would right. come in and that was a for version of outsourcing. Oftentimes those kinds of utilization um, was complicated because there is a dynamic of being a black woman hiring a often black person who's mm -hmm. not a family member to, um, and often not from a uh, sort of quote unquote American tradition and oftentimes uh, may have internalized some of the ideas about what it means to be a black person in society. So people were very kind of reticent about those relationships and often tried to scrutinize the people who would be caring for their children. Yeah. Um, a lot of mothers often, and I think this is something that um, sort of quantitative data has supported, that while um, poor and working class black women have sort of moved away from using family members because those family members often have occupations that they can now um, more easily get in the, in the, in the workforce and, that, and they're lucrative, um, middle class black mothers um, are more likely to still use Ken. And so a lot of the mothers I spoke to, for, at least for periods of time, would use um, their, mo their uh, mothers or other kin members would even move from uh, out of state to help during sort of more intense periods of childcare. And I should say that you know the age range for the kids was you know ten and under. So, but some some of these mothers would um, provide that kind of care. Um, uh, That's interesting because yeah. you reported that all these a lot of these women maintain their presence in the labor market. Yeah. And yet that's very difficult when you have young children. Absolutely. So, and I think that the, and I think that part of that was that their orientation to maintaining mm -hmm. presence in the workforce was that that sh they should be doing that. And mm -hmm. they were supported by their families, both by their I mean obviously spouses that were there were also su supportive, but they often had communities of caregivers who were um, there to support them both instrumentally and psychically. I think, that, and I think it's important to note that part, that they were, they were there saying, you're doing the right thing by being out in the community and utilizing your education to provide for your family. And this doesn't take away from your mother as an identity, from your identity as a mother. It's actually a part of that identity, which I think is something that challenges some of the ways people talk about motherhood um, among mm -hmm. white middle-class moms in the US context. Okay, so thank, thank you. you for your question. Thanks. Sorry. Hopefully, yeah. Other questions? 
Fascinating panel. Thank you so much for your presentations, and uh, we really appreciate your being able to take the time to be here because I know how busy some of you have been. And before we close, I just want to uh, thank all the speakers who uh, agreed to come here for these two days and to really provide us with such important information about the whole topic of women in the world and um, some thought about how we can uh, conceive and begin to put ideas out there about a new paradigm, about how to approach a more peaceful world. And I think over the last day and a half, we've really uh, received a lot of amazing ideas and information which will be very helpful for us to take beyond this conference and to see if we can uh, pursue more research and to write more about this topic. I certainly hope we can get a book out of these proceedings, and I think that's a possibility. But it's, it's uh, mostly to the speakers that I would like to address my thanks, because I think they really brought to light the importance of this topic. So we are going to close this conference at this time and invite all of you to join us in the back of the room for lunch and a safe journey to all those who traveled here and hope to see you at another conference on women where we've advanced a little bit further about our understanding of a new paradigm. Thank you very much. Can I help you in some way here? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>